and welcome to the Geek Legion of Jimmy. This is going to be my collection of sword and sorcery slash medieval fantasy movies that I have on physical media. This is about 95% of my collection. Uh, there is maybe one or two things that, um, that I couldn't find that are in boxes somewhere. But this is the majority of it. Um, and we have to define what I mean by sword and sorcery and medieval fantasy. So, you know, to me it's kind of like a... Um, medieval style kind of setting, although it might not necessarily, because some, some of these uh, take place in alien worlds, so, but it's like, kind of like a uh, where sword-based kind of combat exists, things like that. But also I'm excluding historical fantasy. So things like Gladiator, for example, which takes place in a real historical period, but is um, a work of fiction, so historical fiction really, uh, that also I don't count because it's not really fantasy. There are maybe a couple that kind of blur the lines here and there. Um, but kind of, even things like Robin Hood, which is a complete work of fiction, it's not really fantasy or sword and sorcery unless they kind of veer more into a mystical um, environment, if that makes sense. So we'll, we'll discuss when we get there. I have one or two uh, VHS to show you. I don't have much VHS left. I kind of got rid of them all, to be honest, but I do have one or two left. So the first thing we're going to be looking at here is the ATOR, the Fighting Eagle. This is a UK um, preset VHS, starring, obviously, Miles O'Keefe. Um, there's actually four ATOR series. Three of them stars Mark Miles O'Keefe. The last one, Quest for the Mighty Sword, uh, was a different actor. Um, but there you go. This is kind of renowned as one of the most cheesy sword and sorcery movies, but I still kind of like it. I actually quite like Miles O'Keefe to be honest with you. I'm, you know, it's a shame he didn't do more, really. Uh, next one we're going to talk about is Dragon Slayer. Pretty much a long forgotten about Disney movie. This is again as a pre cert uh, um, VHS. I really adore the cover of this. I saw this at the cinema, and it was a co production between Disney and Paramount. So. I think the reason why this hasn't seen much light of day is because there might be some rights issues with this because it was a co-production. Certainly one of the more darker um, Disney films in, uh, well, ever made, really, to be honest with you. Um, and it, the, the dragon effects are incredible, if you've ever seen this. Um, as you can see here, you've got the uh, Disney home video. This is the rental version, not very south, you can see uh, just here. The story's actually quite slow, to be honest, uh, but when we, once we do get into that dragon action and we, and we see the, the amazing dragon called Vermithax Pro Projective or something her name is, it's awesome. And the effects still pretty much hold up today, but it's that in, in its own is worth watching. Uh, I've got Lou Ferrigno in uh, Hercules. He did a few sword and sorcery uh, flicks. He did Hercules, he did a couple of Sinbad movies, I believe. Um, this one again stars Sybil Danning. The lovely Sybil Dang, who herself has starred in a few fantasy flicks. And then we've got some old school um, sword and sorcery movies. Uh, Magic Sword with Basil Rathbone. Um, this, is, this one is, is showing its age somewhat, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it's still a fun kind of flick. Uh, one of the earlier... Examples, really, of, I would say, sword and sorcery films. And the last one I've got on VHS is uh, Sword of the Valiant, which stars, yes, Sean Connery, uh, believe it or not. Although he is only in, really, a couple of scenes. Uh, this, once again, stars Miles O'Keefe. This is actually a spin-off from the uh, King Arthur legend. It actually focuses on Gwen and the Green Knight. And it's always something I always wish um, King Arthur films did was let's focus a little more on the kind of the knights because they have interesting stories themselves. In particular, Gwen, I think, is probably the most well known. And there you go. Right, so that is it for DVD. Uh, sorry, um, VHS. So we move on to some DVDs. Uh, so, the first one, this is the UK version of um, Beastmaster. It says a director's cut. I can't really remember if this is any different, to be honest with you. It's a while since I've actually watched this particular version. I know there was a few seconds cut, 
um, involving a little bit of nudity from Tanya Roberts. So I don't know if that's what it it, it was referring to, but we're talking literally a few seconds. One of, this is probably my all time favourite fantasy movie, and I have a number of uh, number of versions of it. Uh, next up, we have the Beastmaster series, and this is how I know that I'm missing some because I do have season one somewhere. So this is actually season two, uh, where uh, you have a different character, different actor playing Dar. Not a big fan of this series, to be honest with you. I actually couldn't even finish watching it. Um, it's just really cheesy. It's like Xena Warrior Princess, and, and I just don't really like that kind of cheesiness, to be honest. Um, you know, to me, Beastmaster was quite adult, but this isn't. <laughs> Although Mark Singer does turn up, uh, but not as not as star. He turns up later in the uh, in the seasons in the series. Okay, so we are going to have a Robin Hood uh, property in here because I think this one veers more on fantasy. Uh, Robin of Sherwood. Um, this is a eighties TV show here in the UK, and this one. It's actually quite historic, you want to say. It was kind of the first one to really uh, put in a lot of mysticism. We have witches. There's, in latter seasons, we have even demons and things and, and clay monsters. Kind of, there's a, there's a, There are fantasy elements here. Magic sword. Uh, the, what you're looking at is um, a DVD box set for season one. And this was from a, re a retail that's long gone in the UK called MVC. And you get a variety of postcards and stuff on there. Nice little set. Um, only six episodes, I think, there was in the first season. And then we have season two. So Michael Prade played uh, Robin Hood here. But he, was, uh, he wanted to leave, so they killed him off at the end of season two. But it's the, the, last, the last few episodes are really awesome. And uh, season three, he was actually replaced with Jason Connery, son of Sean Connery. And there's actually multiple legends of Robin Hood. And this is, this is what the series uh, did. It actually had a different person take up the mantle of Robin Hood. Um, because there's two legends where one is that he was a kind of a low-born, uh, just commoner who, who kind of like fought for the kind of the rights of the poor, etc. But there's also another legend where he was actually a nobleman who kind of, you know, had the kind of uh, the alter ego, so to speak. And this one takes that second legend. So we have a different character, really, taking up the mantle of Robin Hood. His name isn't actually Robin Hood in, in, in this, it's, he, but he calls himself that because he's sort of taking up the mantle. Uh, and then we have the season two part two, sorry, season three part two. Uh, so this was the longest season and actually has more episodes with Jason Connery than we did with um, Michael Prade. But they only had one season and it kind of ended on, you know, there was going to be a fourth season, but it got cancelled, unfortunately. So we never really got the res resolution, to be honest. Um, but there you go. One of my, one of my favourite TV shows ever, this. Right, now we're getting into some, some cheesy stuff. Uh, so this is actually a box set um, from Germany with four films, two of which are uh, Wizards of the Lost Kingdom 1 and 2. And this is the only way I could get Wizards of the Lost Kingdom 2. Unfortunately, it's dubbed in German with no English audio or even subs, so it was kind of a bit of a waste of money. Um, the other two movies are kind of like monster films. Uh, but this was... I wanted to get... Um, Let's say, Wizards of the Lost Kingdom 2, uh, at the moment, we are still missing that one. I had it on VHS, but not anymore. Anyway, so, Conan, the legendary Conan. You might be thinking, that doesn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And you are correct. That is Ralph Muller, who is a, he's a good friend of Arnie's. And he actually played Conan in the short-lived TV series, um that you may not even know existed, but it did. And here you go. And I think this is kind of like the pilot episode sort of thing. Uh, Myths of Avalon, which is a um, 
it's again, it's a legendary uh, uh, Excalibur, our King Arthur, the kind of spin-off, really. This one, it focuses on the female characters from the um, the King Arthur legend, but it's still it's still pretty good. A bit, bit more kind of dramatic, if that makes sense, rather than action. I was debating whether to include this one, because this is the King Arthur, the, the realistic version, which is meant to be um, the kind of more factual what it's based on. So arguably not really a fantasy movie as such, because it kind of removes all of that stuff out, but it's, it seems odd to just to exercise this one film from any King Arthur uh, movies I have. Uh, Connecticut in King Arthur's Court, yep, so again a weird little spin-off, there's, there's been a bunch of these, these this particular uh, source material, this is just one adaptation, like a movie of the week one, obviously super kind of cheap production. Uh, probably the best and uh, most well-known King Arthur film is Excalibur. This is the uh, Snapper Case uh, DVD version I still have. I have to, I do have this on Blu-ray, so you shall see shortly. Uh, Fire and Ice, an animated fantasy movie, which is pretty good. I'm not the biggest fan of animation, to be honest with you, but uh, this movie I do like. It's kind of similar to... Uh, the Lord of the Rings animated series, which I did have on VHS uh, at some point. Uh, but there you go. Krull. Now, this is what I mean. This is actually takes, doesn't take place on Earth. It's kind of an alien world almost. A little bit, like I suppose, a little bit like Game of Thrones, to be honest. But it is a fantasy-esque style movie. And uh, was really made to be a new franchise in the kind of the vein of Star Wars, but it never really had the success uh, that it kind of wanted. I still enjoyed it. An early appearance from Liam Neeson. And a uh, great score of this movie as well. Really, I really enjoy the score for this one. Quest for the Delta Knights. This is, um, uh, I think it's, uh, this is Australian DVD. And this is a pretty cheesy um, movie that I was after for ages. Uh, I, I'd never seen it and I was tr trying to track down a copy and eventually I got this uh, Australian um, version of it which is not a very good movie when I, when I saw it. I was a huge fan. Sword and Sorcery is kind of one of my favourite genres that really doesn't get the kind of like the fan base like horror does or sci-fi even. So, you know, I'm sort of keeping that Sword and Sorcery fire burning. Uh, now we're getting to some more modern ones, Earth uh, DVDs. Dragon Mountain is kind of a low budget movie, which is which is not the only film to do this, but there's a few films that have used the the uh, Lord of the Rings kind of template to make a, a similar style, similar um, look to that its film. So it almost like feels like it's taking place within the kind of the Tolkien universe, although it has no official ties. And this is basically about a group of dwarves that are kind of trapped in this mine and um, shenanigans happen. That cover looks great. It's one of those examples where the cover makes it look far more epic than it actually is. Uh, most of this is uh, dialogue in the mines. It's not a particularly interesting movie. That dragon is in it for literally one scene in the end. However, I do have a quote on here. It looks, it looks awesome, but it's incredibly boring. <laughs> Speaking of quotes, I have to talk about this one. Dragon Kingdom, and this is a this is a low budget attempt, a British movie to kind of recapture those glory days of the eighties sword and sorcery movies. Now I had a little bit of an issue with this. I got sent a screen of this and well early, when it was just still not quite finished post production. Reviewed it, sent my review to the uh, company that makes it, which they asked, which they asked me to do. And then it has this quick this quote on here from me. More dragons than the Hobbit films combined. Now, I never said that quote in the review. Um, and then they sort of sent me the kind of like the mock-up image of it. And I was like, damn, they've misquoted me. And I didn't really know what to do. So I deleted my original, and I regret doing this now. And I, re and I regret, sorry, I deleted my original review, re-recorded it, just so I can incorporate this line 
Although it doesn't make sense because there's only, obviously only one dragon in the bloody Hobbit films, and I got like beasted on Reddit for it. Uh, it's kind of embarrassing because it's just like everyone was pointing out, oh, so there's two dragons. <laughs> um, but I never actually said it in my original review, and I kind of I wish I didn't sort of cave in and just re-record it because I could have. I could have proved it then, if that makes sense, but now I can't. So anyway, but this is actually a, still a quite a fun movie. It's It's got sort of practical monsters and things in there. It's quite fun, but um, oh, this is actually the second film, uh, I think, actually, thinking about it. Yeah, so this is the second movie, and there's, there was meant to be three. The third one never actually materialised. And this was the first movie, uh, so it's meant to be a trilogy of, of films. Uh, and this one's got, um, it's about these kind of knights and stuff and dragons and they've got undead zombies and stuff. It is cheap and it does kind of crack a little bit under the uh, the weight of what it's trying to do. But, you know, I still it's still somewhat fun. Uh, Sorceress. This is actually my favourite out of the kind of the Roger and Corman produced sword and sorcery movies that... Um, that he produced back in the 80s. And this one stars two real life twin sisters who are the kind of the buxom heroines and have to go on a quest. And a lot of these scenes were then reused in other Roger Corman movies. Um, but this was the original. Uh, Dragon's Rage. Now this movie has been retitled and I can't remember what the original title is. But if you look for Dragon's Rage review, I have reviewed this. And it will tell you the, um, the original movie's title on that. Um, this is one of those kind of more modern films that has sort of fled under the radar. It does have quite a lot of kind of practical makeup and different monster effects. But I didn't think it was a particularly amazing film. To be honest, certainly. And that's, that's true of a lot of these films. You know, they never really live up to the kind of the, uh, the hype that is on here, if that makes sense. Hawks the Slayer, cheesy British sword and sorcery movie with an absolutely amazing soundtrack. I love the soundtrack. It sounds like it's a proper rip-off of like, the Good, the Bad and the Ugly um, kind of style uh, soundtrack, but I love it. It's just, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like Morricone if he did disco is the best way I'd describe it. <laughs> but it's, the movie is kind of silly, but it has the, one of the greatest fantasy characters, this elf character called Crow. He like fires off like the arrows like if it's in the, like he's got a machine gun. It's brilliant. This one I, I shouldn't really put in. It's not really a fantasy movie, but I, I do want to talk about it because I just this is a great film um, that is actually based on the real Vlad the Impaler, and this film never gets spoken about. And it's like the historical film based on Vlad the Impaler's life, which to be honest with you. Has never really, really been to, 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 had a film about it outside of this and a couple of kind of like European films. Um, this one has actually stars Rudolf Martin. Now, if you are a Buffy fan, it's worth watching because this guy played Dracula in Buffy and he looks the same. He's still got the long hair. So you can almost treat this as like a prequel to the um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer uh, season five, episode one. This is like a pre prequel to that, really. So if you're a Buffy fan, check it out. Right, now we have some uh, Blu-rays. And we'll start off with the still books. And I'm just going to whip through these. So this is the Game of Thrones series, obviously. When you talk about, you know, sword and sorcery and fantasy, this is kind of like where the conversation is in modern times. So I'm just going to whip through these. So I have all the seasons in this um, steelbook format, and uh, they were in the UK. They were exclusive to Zavi, and each of them comes with this sigil magnet, which is quite cool. Now, after this was released, they they released a further steelbook with like a complete series steelbook on 4K with all the seasons on there, but. You know, I'm not rebuying them. I don't even have a 4K player, so there you go. So I will stick to the um, the steel books. Here's season five. This is my favourite out of the seasons because it has the hard home episode. So 
Season six. Season, season seven, this is where it started to lose people a lot of the time. I didn't actually mind season seven, to be honest with you. However, season eight, I think, is universally um, never no one's favourite. <laughs> this is the only one that's on 4K in this one for some reason. Okay, then we have a German metal pack. And this is actually has, I think it's three films on there, kind of like lower budget um, CGI monster, kind of dragon things. Um, yeah, so we've got Midnight Chronicles, uh, The Fire Dragon Chronicles, and Dragon Quest. So all kind of like with CGI dragons and stuff. Um, I don't really like getting collections, to be honest with you, but this was kind of like, you can't get them any other way, so there you go. <laughs> Outlander, this is a metal pack. Again, you could say so this is more of a sci-fi than fantasy, uh, about kind of this alien guy that comes down in, um, I think, sort of the Vikings and ends up kind of fighting with them. I don't know, so it's more sci-fi in a way, to be fair. Some, some of these are quite hard to quantify. Uh, Prince of Persia. Um, again, this is based on a video game. But I suppose if you take that out of it, 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 it kind of plays a little bit like a uh, sword and sandal type movie, really. So I suppose it counts. And then we have Vikingdom. Again, this was a little bit... Oh, do I include this one? Because it's obviously based on Vikings, which are a real thing. But this is kind of so OTT and has, like, the gods and stuff in there. And it's a little bit more fantasy. So I thought I would include it. And uh, this is like a kind of... It's it's like a bit like 300, if you know what I mean. It's kind of filmed like that with lots of kind of green screen and stuff. Um, and then we have... Um, Warcraft again based in a video game. Uh, I saw this at the cinema. This was this still books from Zoom. I thought it was okay. I suppose you could say Dracula Untold is is a kind of a um, another retelling of uh, Vlad the Impaler, but it's I think it's so off the actual what happened. It's it's really its own thing and more about the vampires so stuff. But it still is a medieval tale, so to speak. Some kind of you can watch this as a fantasy movie, I would say. Uh, Willow. George Lucas is attempt at a fantasy movie, and apparently they're making either a TV series or a second film of this. I really enjoyed Val Kilmer in this film and um his interactions with Joanne Whaley, who later became Joanne Whaley Kilmer uh, from this movie. Um, I don't think it's all that good, though, um, to be honest. Uh, Gods of Egypt. Haven't actually watched this one yet, to be honest. Uh, I know this got criticised through, you know, the, the new Hollywood lens because it's whitewashing and all of this. But it's kind of, it seems like it would be a Clash of the Titans style kind of um, uh, film there. And yeah, so I haven't seen it, so I can't really comment on the film yet. It's one of those movies that I bought and have intended to watch, but have yet to do so. Thor, um, The Hammer of the Gods. Again, you could say, oh, this is not really a fantasy film, but this one totally is. And Thor in this one is just a guy. He's not like really the kind of the son of Odin. And he actually, it's about fighting werewolves, weirdly. It's like a really weird film to make a, a like a, a Thor film about. But yeah, he fights like a bunch of werewolves in this. And he's just like some dude called Thor. Uh, Flesh and Blood. Rutger Hauer made a couple of uh, fantasy movies. This and Lady Hawk. I don't actually have Lady Hawk because I'm not really a big fan of that one. This one is certainly more of a violence and kind of anti-hero style um, movie. Uh, again, this is really, I suppose, very uh, sword and sorcery. Not really, I suppose. It's more of just a, a 
slash them up to be fair more than anything else. Uh, we have Conan. This is the remake that starred Jason Momoa. This is the uh, French still book. I actually didn't mind this movie. I just have no real desire to watch it again, to be honest. Uh, then we've got uh, Conan, of course. Um, probably the, 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 the movie that really made sword and sorcery films. Uh, this is actually a French, I want to say, still book. Uh, and this one has both movies on it. So the Conan the Barbarian and Conan the Destroyer. And then we have a Spanish still book with the same. Both two movies on there. And then we have the British version still book. There's actually been two British, they, they re-released it in a kind of a, a second version, which was looks mildly different, but this is the first one. And then we have the uh, German metal pack. Uh, DVD snuck in there, Eragon. So this is uh, this was meant to be the first film in a line of kind of uh, movies based on kind of young adult books, and this one bombed. So it was only ever a one film. Hansel and Gretel, Witch Hunters. Again, I might be pushing it with uh, fantasy here, but it's kind of a period setting. There's a certain amount of uh, fancy involved in kind of uh you know hand-to-hand -hand combat so i think it more or less just about counts as the fantasy rather than the horror uh lord of the rings the fellowship of the ring and this is the extended version and um i know you can get them the more recent uh kind of versions of this but you know, I don't have a 4K player, as I've kind of said. So, here we go. They only released this, 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 the first movie on extended still, but which is annoying. Then I have the American version on the, the theatrical cut of Two Towers. And I have uh, the Return of the King on Italian version. So I've got British, American and Italian, all three different style still books. How annoying. Uh, I've got, do you know, I've got so many Hobbit films, I haven't even put them in order. I've got about a million of these Hobbit still books somehow. Uh, so this is Unexpected Journey. Battle of the Five Armies. And I have put, I've misplaced the other one of these Jumbo Steel books. I also have um, The Hobbit in a lenticular French version. This is the first movie. Okay, so what else have we got? We've got Camelot. This was a short lived TV series that starred Eva Green. And um, only lasted one season, and again, it's based on the kind of the, the Legend of King Arthur, as you can probably imagine. So this is a, a tin box set, Blu-ray set from Germany. Uh, probably a set I think most people have seen by now. This is the Vinegar Syndrome Beastmaster, and this is obviously the best release that you can get of this film. Um, I won't go into the, the whole opening up because I know everyone's already done that. But yes, yeah, great release. I'm obviously I'm glad that they they have a nice copy of this. Uh, Red Sonia. This is a Korean version. Uh, I think it, I want to say it was Kimchi DVD perhaps, and uh, it's a limited edition to five hundred copies. It's just an amore, but you've got like a nice booklet in there with some nice artwork. 
And of course, to start Arnie. Now it's now in the Huntsman. This is a HMV edition with art cards. I'm going to break my own rule here um, because this movie does take place in contemporary times, but there's a caveat in here. As I said with uh, another movie, this film takes its cues from the Lord of the Rings films and has a very similar style in regards to the prosthetics and the orcs and stuff, but uses it in a different film. So it's almost, you almost feel this is kind of like an unofficial spin-off. Now what happens here is a gateway opens up and all the kind of the denizens of this fantasy world end up coming into our, and it's like rural uh, America somewhere. So we get all these orcs, dragons and elves spilling out into our world and it's up to these kind of like locals to try and uh, fight them off. Um, this this movie I really enjoyed, I've got to say. Um, I actually watched it dubbed first of all and had subtitles with it. Uh, but then it, obviously I've got the... the um, um, this version, which is obviously you can have the proper audio in it. This is a French uh, Blu-ray. You can get other Blu-rays, but I like the cover better on this one. Like Lord of the Rings, maybe it might be worth checking it out. Beastmaster. This is the Umbrella release, an Australian release that I had prior to the uh, um, Vinegar Syndrome one, and I think probably this is what most people had. Until that point. The Australian version I know has a couple of seconds extra on it. So there you go. Uh, Flight of Dragons. This is a great uh, animated movie that d doesn't get spoken about enough. Is It's an older movie. It's kind of in the 80s. But it's, it has quite adult themes. And about this guy who plays like fantasy games. Like Dungeons and Dragons get kind of sucked into this actual fantasy realm. And ends up becoming a dragon, but has to use his knowledge of science to help him escape. Uh, Hawk the Slayer, we spoke about earlier. This is the uh, UK Blu-ray version of it. Uh, Iron Master. Now this kind of looks like it would be a fantasy movie, but it's actually more of like a caveman film, to be honest with you. Uh, but I think it's still probably it still kind of counts in the in the overall um, conversation, so to speak. Um, but the cover here is is not particularly you know representative of what's in the actual film. Um, and this one, obviously, you've got George Eastman, and it's it's okay, a little bit forgettable, to be quite honest. Uh, Rise of the Shadow Warrior. This film has been retitled like a bunch of times. There's loads of different like titles for this movie. The Shadow Cabal, all sorts of ones. I can't remember what the other ones. And, and again, it's this is a from a company called Arrow Storm Entertainment, who kind of specialise in making uh, fantasy movies. And they are the ones that did the Orc Wars as well. So again, it has a somewhat of a similar aesthetic to the kind of the Lord of the Rings. But this one is all set in a kind of a fantasy world, and it's a pretty good. Um, you know, low budget affair. This company also did the Mythica series, which I actually wasn't a fan of. I thought the Mythica series was too drawn out, but this movie I actually thought was pretty good. It's cheap though, it looks cheap. Okay. So, again, I've got the Robin, Robin of Sherwood on Blu ray. This one incorporates uh, both two the series one and two with Michael Braid. And then season three with Jason Connery. Uh, the Dragon Phoenix Chronicles. I think this is a Spanish movie. Uh, it was a little bit rough to get through. I'm not going to lie. Bit of a blind by that one. I mean, I'm a bit of a sucker for fantasy movies. I thought, ooh, purchase. And it wasn't particularly good. Uh, this was the original release I had for it. I um, can't remember which country this is from, to be honest with you, but uh, some type of European country. It's multi region. Damn it, I've got a few rogue DVDs in here. So, Dungeon and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons 3. 
Uh, the Book of the Vile Darkness. I know the first Dungeons and Dragons maybe was awful. The second one's fairly good, to be honest with you, in a low-budget fair. But the third one I really enjoyed. Um, because it's kind of like the Suicide Squad, but the medieval uh, and fantasy settings, where we have a group of bad guys that kind of go on a quest. And they all have varying degrees of morality, shall we say. And, uh, yeah, I, I actually quite enjoy this movie. Yeah, it's cheap. But I actually thought it, the fact that it has bad guys as the kind of our main protagonists, I enjoyed it. Well, one of them is not really a bad guy. He's undercover. I also have that same film on Blu-ray. I do have the second film somewhere. I think that may still be in the box somewhere. We have Kroll, and this is from the HMV Premium Collection. This version is the, is the original release that actually got pulled off sale because the aspect ratio was wrong. Um, I don't know if it looks any different from the kind of the re-release. I would imagine the barcode is probably the only thing that's probably different about this version of the movie. Uh, but yeah, Kroll, we've already spoken about it. It's a great film. Uh, Atoll the Fighting Eagle. This is the uh, Blu-ray release from uh, Dark Force Entertainment, which is an American one, and they have it have this quite cool kind of glow in the dark um, embossed slipcase. And it's got this sexy Sabrina Sayani in it, who I always think looks like a blonde version of um, uh, uh, oh God, who's the one from Dust Till Dawn? Salma Hayek. Right, in the home stretch now, so we're talking some media books. So um, I'm really happy that we're getting these kind of limited edition releases of older films uh, that are coming out from Germany. And uh, Deathstalker is probably more the one of the well-known well series. There's four films in the Deathstalker uh, franchise, shall we call it. Um, and there's three different actors that play Deathstalker. Uh, this first one, I think it was Rick Hill. And this one is played more straight, um... And, you know, is okay. Got Lana Clarkson in there as well, who obviously was murdered in real life. Uh, Deathstalker, to look, Deathstalker 2, which I think is the best out of the Deathstalker series. Um, this one, is its tongue is more in cheek. It's more of a kind of a, uh, a comedy um to be honest, but it's, I think it works the best because it, this, this can't, you know, it just can't do the kind of a serious movie. Um, so it plays it for kind of like more of a uh, silliness, but it's, it works, I think, for this movie and it's the best. There's still action and stuff in there, but it, to me, this is the best Death Talker film. Uh, Barbarian Queen, uh, this is the first movie. There are two Barbarian Queen films. They have yet to release the second one. I don't know if they actually will on a, on a media book. And uh, again, if this is one of those films that kind of follows a very sort of similar template. Um, you know, we've got kind of, it's a Roger Corman producer until we get the old stock footage from other films, things like this. Uh... We have Gore. This has actually got both films in there. So Gore and then Outlaw of Gore. And this is kind of... Um, this is basically where we have a guy from contemporary Earth get sucked into a fantasy world. And you've got some fairly big names in here. Um, Oliver Reed and Jack Palance play the bad guy in each of the kind of the movies. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, just, it's quite fun. But this was this was criticised, obviously it's somewhat of, a, of, of its time, but it was criticised for being extremely misogynistic uh, by today's standards. Which is, you know, I guess it's somewhat fair if you judge it by today's standards, but hell, I still love it, so there you go. Uh, Amazons. So... I actually think this is a quite. This is one of the best uh, fantasy movies from the eighties, which isn't kind of like Conan or Beastmaster. And although it, although it seems like it's com completely exploitative, which I guess it is, 
I still liked it because the Amazons here, they're not like against men. The Amazon, the way it works in this movie is they're like the special forces of this particular kind of like kingdom. Like this female, it's a bit like um, Black Panther, I suppose. Well, they have like a, a like female sort of special forces. So they just kind of like, it's not women against men. It's just like that they have this kind of like crack team of Amazon warriors. So I kind of quite like that. And it's when you look at it, it seems like it's going to be men versus women, but it isn't. Anyway, but it's um, it's quite a fun film, and uh, yeah, I, I quite enjoyed this. And there's kind of lots of action and uh, lots of uh, boobies, which you probably get in that one. Um, Warrior and the Sorceress. So this one stars David Carradine. This is actually a DVD media book and is kind of a um, retelling of Yojimbo, uh, of course, which has been adapted many a time, including, uh, obviously, the uh, the Dollars trilogy. This is the fantasy version of it. And there are other fantasy films that do the same. You know, there's, there's like a fantasy version of um, Magnificent Seven, which is, of course, Seven Samurai called Seven Magnificent Gladiators, which has yet to have a... Uh, a release on disc one day I'm sure it will turn up I know Honda's coming soon so I'll definitely be getting that uh, Wizards of the Lost Kingdom this is um, more of a child's fancy movie uh, this creature in the front I think my most people will remember if you've seen it as actually from the movie Sorceress uh, to be honest and uh, this one's got Bose Venton in it and this is probably one of the worst films that uses footage from other other films. It's it has it has its own footage, but it uses a lot of the kind of like the 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 effects and kind of like the bigger scale stuff is from other films. It's really Roger Corman is such a cheap ass. But there you go. Uh, Sorceress, is, uh, which I was just speaking about, this is the movie that really was the first in the kind of the, the Roger Corman's uh, sword and sorcery range, and a lot of movie, a lot of footage from this film is used in other films, including that monster in the, on the front. Uh, and again, we've kind of I've shown you the DVD version of this, and it has these twin females that are the kind of like the um, the protagonists here. Uh, then we have a nice French media book from uh, for Excalibur, and I just like that because it's got uh, Mordred on the front, who I always thought his armour was really creepy. Um, again, I don't think you can get better uh, Arthur film than this one, to be honest with you. And finally, the, the the last film I have in a kind of a sword and sorcery uh, genre, at least to hand, I think there may be one or two others, as I say, in boxes, is uh, the Barbarians, and this has this uh, these uh, these real life brothers that play these twin muscle bound, and they're like dolls, they're like complete idiots. This is this was always like an eighteen certificate when I, when I was a VHS, so I really wanted to see it when I was you know young because I thought it'd be oh, this is going to be super hardcore. It's super cheesy, however. And that is it. That is my collection of fancy slash sword and sorcery movies. What do you think? Are any of those films that you have seen uh, and like, or any that you haven't seen them and are maybe now maybe kind of like more tempted to check out? Leave us a comment, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now.